Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to the earth, for living a perfect life, for being qualified to be the substitutionary death in our place that we needed but did not deserve. Thank you for being life and resurrection and truth and love incarnate. We thank you that you had power over death and you have power over death for all who are in you. Lord Jesus, we have in you what the world cannot touch, what the world so desperately needs. And on this day, we praise you all over again for an empty tomb and for the promise of resurrection and life with you forever. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. We're going to open our Bibles this morning together and look in the Gospel of John in chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to have a Bible. And there are some men here, some servants who will pass out Bibles so you can be looking along with us. If you don't own a Bible, uh, this Bible that we give you today is yours to keep. Just slip up your hand if you need to look on uh, a copy of God's Word this morning, or you need one uh, because you don't have one. Just slip your hand up, the men will give you a Bible. And if you're here with us for the first time, we're so glad. We're so glad that you're visiting with us today. Uh, we, we want you to understand what we're all about, and, and Easter Sunday is a great Sunday to understand what the church is. Thank you, church, for singing the praises of our Savior who conquered death. We teach one another, we sing to one another in these songs the truths that are everything. They have changed our lives. If you're with us just visiting this morning, we're so glad that you get to look in on what this Christianity is all about. If you have questions about Jesus, about what it means to follow Him, about what it means to have eternal life, there will be people here to answer questions and pray with you after the service. There's also an information desk on the outside on your way out. We would love to meet you there, to visit with you. We have a gift to give you for a first-time visitor. And we love to interact with you, meeting any spiritual needs that we can today. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. And we'll spend a few moments this morning looking at one verse. John chapter 5 and verse 24. Here are the words of Jesus recorded for us. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. People all around us make audacious claims. They say with their words things they cannot guarantee. If you've been on the Home Shopping Network, you know what I'm talking about. Everything under the sun is sold with the promise of unbelievable results. Those who fashion new diet programs and exercise regimes promise the same things. Do what I say, trust me, and the results will be unbelievable. And I think they're onto something. Unbelievable is the right word. We've tried them. We've done them. We haven't experienced the results. The products have rusted and broken and fallen apart and, and we returned them and got a refund and got a replacement and the replacement broke too. And all of these people proclaiming truth and making claims cause us to ask the question, what is truth? We become skeptical and cynical of someone making audacious claims and, and someone making high and lofty promises just blends into the background of all of those other high and lofty promises. But the words that Jesus utters here in John 5.24 
are shockingly, audaciously bigger promises than any of those on the home shopping network. Bigger claims than any life coach or exercise expert. What Jesus says here are words that are truly unbelievable. But you know the resurrection changes everything. These words are believable on the lips of the one who is the resurrection and the life. And there's no one like Jesus. No human has ever commanded a dead man to walk out of a tomb. And Jesus did, and the dead man obeyed. And no human has ever walked out of his own tomb. Jesus did. Make no mistake, the appearance of Jesus on the earth was no mirage. He was no phantom. He was 100% human. And he wasn't from around here. He was 100% God too. He took on flesh and dwelt among us and taught us and lived an exemplary life, a sinless one. No human ever did that. And he was killed on a cross. What do we know about that death? It it was not an accident, a happenstance, a, a victim of circumstances. He said, I lay down my life, nobody takes it from me, and I take it up again. I have authority to do so. There's no one like Jesus. And he went to his own death, and he walked out of his own tomb to secure life for all who would believe him. And so when Jesus says these words, we believe him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. These are bold claims. And this is the truth. I'm going to give you an outline for this passage. This morning, we're looking at three life and death realities for those who believe in Jesus. You can bank on these, these are truth, they are real, and they are for believers. Notice Jesus begins this verse by saying, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me. These parallel phrases, you hear Jesus' words and you believe the one that sent him. They go together, they are two facets on the diamond of this Remarkable phrase. They are in parallel and they describe the same reality. To hear Jesus' words is to listen to him, to heed him, to put them in their proper place in your life. It's possible to hear things, to perceive audible sounds. It's a different thing in this context to hear the words of Jesus. He who has ears, let him hear what Jesus says. And this is in parallel to the phrase that Jesus says, and believes him who sent me. Who is it that sent the beloved son? The father. God the father sent God the son to the earth to accomplish the salvation from sin of everyone who would believe. And these parallel phrases together, you hear the words of Jesus and believe him who sent him, they are inextricably linked because the Son and the Father are inextricably linked in their person and in their message. There's something you have to understand about Jesus. This bold claim is an exclusive one. You cannot get to God without him. If you have some notion that there are many roads to heaven, that there are many ways to get to God, that is disassembled here. To believe in Him who sent the Son is to listen to the words of the Son. You can't separate these out. You can't get to God around Jesus. You can't be offended by Jesus and sort of be spiritual and think you're going to be okay in the end. Jesus said, I am the way 
the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through me. That's what he means by those who hear my word and believe him who sent me. And think about belief for just a moment. It is one thing to believe that air exists. It's another to take it into your lungs. It's one thing to believe, for instance, that Jesus is good, that He is God and man. It's one thing to believe, to acknowledge that He is Lord of the universe. It's one thing to assent to the historical reality that He died on a cross and rose from the grave. It is one thing to affirm, yes, Jesus died for sins, to pay for sins. But it is a different thing to believe Him by entrusting yourself to Him. To believe that Jesus died for your sins. To recognize that you are a sinner with a deep-seated, unfixable problem before God. And the only remedy to the problem of your sin and your guilt before God is that justice is met by all of those sins being paid for. That's what Jesus came to do. To actually satisfy justice in a one-for-one correspondence between your crimes and the holy God who is offended by them. To believe that Jesus died for sin is one thing. To Entrust yourself to Jesus as the only remedy for your sins personally. That's the kind of belief Jesus talks about here. To entrust your life to Him means not only believing that Jesus is the only solution to the problem of sin, but it is a surrender to Him as the one in charge. I want Him to direct my life. By the way, that's a good thing. If you stop and think about how life goes with you in charge and the end thereof. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. A death that is met here under the sun and then a death that is encountered in the presence of God when you have to give account for all you've done and said and thought. To believe the gospel means to believe that Jesus died in your place to save you. And to surrender your life to Jesus by entrusting yourself to his goodness, to his care. And you will find your life transformed as a result. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me leads to three realities. The first reality is believers possess life that never ends. Three little words in the English Bible, has eternal life. The one who believes has eternal life. Notice the way this is said. He does not say he who believes will have eternal life when your time here on earth is done and then there's that other thing afterwards. This is present tense. He who believes in Jesus possesses eternal life now. This is a present reality. Jesus didn't slip up in his verb tenses. He didn't make a grammatical error here. This is on purpose. If you are a believer in Jesus, you all of a sudden are in this category of possessing eternal life. And eternal life is a kind of life and a duration of life. It is the kind of life that comes from above. It is about being born again, being born from above, having life from God. Not a life you could generate yourself, not a fresh start from a bad start, but new and spiritual life wrought of God. It's not just a kind of life, it is also a duration of life. It is a new life that begins when you are born again through faith in Jesus. And that life never ends. It goes straight through earthly physical mortality. 
into an eternal existence in joy and life and peace and fulfillment in God through Christ. And as some authors have said, every day in that eternal life is better than the day before. There is an increasing capacity and experience of joy in Christ that awaits believers that is just incomparable. And we should expect this from the one who is called the author of life, the one who possesses life intrinsically. He says, I have life in myself. Nobody gave it to him. Jesus didn't come into existence out of something else. He has always been. He has life intrinsically. John 14, 6 says he is the life. He is the resurrection and the life. He gives life to those who are his and he gives it abundantly. He says the life that is in believers is like a river that continually flows. And so believers in Jesus have eternal life. You possess a life that never ends. Second reality for those who believe in Jesus is simply this. Believers do not come into judgment. Look at the next phrase. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. Does not come into judgment is the result of possessing eternal life. It means that you do not face the second death, the, the judgment of the dead. You, you will not face the, the bar of the holy justice of God. Romans 2 tells us that every man will be assessed by his deeds. For those who believe in Jesus, every sin, past, present, and future, every foul motive, every stray word, every dirty deed is canceled at the cross, forgiven, and the guilt of it is removed as far as the east is from the west. God remembers our sins no more. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the one who believes in the gospel who hears Jesus' words and believes him who sent him, does not come into judgment. Again, no slip of grammar here. The verb tense is on purpose. This present tense reality is you do not come into judgment. This ongoing reality is if you are in Jesus, you are no longer liable to the judgment that all of us were due. Listen, we're all sinners. We've all failed We've all violated God's holy commands. We've all fallen short. And, and we hear people around us say, nobody's perfect. Well, God doesn't lower the bar. <laughs> and far from being just shy, and there's grace for the gap. God's assessment of our condition is there is no one who is good, not even one. <laughs> there is no one who seeks after God. They have all turned away. Even the best things that we think we might do that could earn God's favor, God considers filthy rags and rubbish. Our best deeds need forgiveness. And in the gospel, all of those are erased and canceled and forgiven. Not by a blink of an eye or a wave of a hand but by the infinitely costly substitutionary death of Jesus in our place where he actually bore them and paid for them. This is why the Bible can say God can be just and the justifier of those who believe in Jesus. Justice gets met. Sins get punished in their fullness. God's infinite holy wrath goes out against our sin and is extinguished in the infinite person of Jesus as he labors on the cross to pay for them. Believers do not come into judgment. Revelation 20 verses 11 to 13 details that day before that great white throne judgment of God when the dead will be judged. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you already possess eternal life and you are no longer the dead and you will not come into judgment. There's a third reality in this text. 
believers have left death behind. Believers have left death behind. Look at the last phrase. The one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has passed out of death into life. The sense of the verb here is a a past action with continuing results into the present. If I tell you that I took out the trash, that means at some point in the past I took it out. But if I say, I have taken out the trash, that means I took it out in the past and there's still room in the trash can for more. Here, believers have passed out of death into life. That is, believers at a point in time passed out of death and are still in the continual state of having passed out of death. They've left death behind. The word for having passed out of is an idea of transfer. It's a transfer of one location to another location or the transfer from one state or condition into another state or condition. And here you and I were localized in the realm of death. We we were death walking. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. We were liable to our own physical mortality and death under the sun. And then we were liable to the second death and the judgment of the dead. To exist forever in an eternal death in the lake of fire. All of that was true. And the believer in Jesus Christ has been transferred out of that locality called death. And has been transferred into life. Believer, you've left death behind. (laughs) To be joined to Christ and to be joined to his resurrection means that something has fundamentally, inalterably been changed for you. You belong to him and death no longer has hold. It's interesting in Romans 8 when we discover that not even death can separate us from the love of Christ. Believers will still face their own physical mortality, but now belonging to the realm of life, having passed out of death and possessing eternal life, they will transgress or transcend that earthly barrier called mortality and in that never be separated from the love of God in Christ. This is a resurrection reality for believers in Jesus Christ. And we go back to the one who made this promise in John 5, 24. Who is he? Is this the audacious claim of somebody on an infomercial? Saying things he can't come through on? No, this is the very one who entered into this world, lived among us, and died. Very really, very physically, and rose again. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him because he is the life. And he promises life to all who believe in him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, the life. You are the resurrection. And you promise life and no judgment and the removal from the realm of death for all who hear you and believe him who sent you. Oh Lord Jesus, we believe. We pray for any even gathered here this morning that have not yet experienced life. Oh God, would this be the day for them? Let them turn from everything worthless and decaying, everything that will be crumpled up and thrown away, everything that will burn, and let them turn to you and have life and life eternal. Let them this day come out of judgment and leave death far behind by your supernatural power and your grace and your love. In Jesus' name. Amen.